Okay, good evening. Now, thanks for joining us for this info session from the Township of Muskoka Lakes about the Community Improvement Plan. We've got one more person coming in. Here we go. This is the second year that the Township has run a program to um, provide business incentives to support our business community, starting with the downtowns of Bala and Port Carling. Now, as you know, the Muskoka Lakes Chamber of Commerce is not part of the Township of Muskoka Lakes. Um, well, we're part of the township, but we're not part of the actual municipality government. Uh, but our role is to make sure that you know about these kinds of programs coming down the pipe for you and to connect you with the experts who really know these programs best. Um, just a couple of uh, little uh, housekeeping rules here. If you have questions and you don't, you can jump in. But if you, I think probably you'd want to hold them to the end, James, because you're going to do your presentation first. But if you have questions, you can also put them in the chat. So if you look at the very bottom of your screen, you'll see there's a chat button and you can ask me and I can make sure that the question gets asked. I'll keep watching that chat really carefully. All right. Now, before I hand off to Township Economic Development Officer James Cox, who is no stranger to these types of programs, I'm going to ask us to do a bit of a round the room. Let's see if we I can see the gallery. I can put you on speakers. Um, and uh, why don't you just actually I'm not seeing everybody. Uh, for some reason. No, ter Terry's just come in. And I thought maybe we could just uh, introduce ourselves. So I'm Nora Fountain from Muskoka Lakes Chamber. I see you're seeing James. Um, anybody else want to just say a quick hello? I can't see who's on the screen. So maybe I could start with Tina. What about you? You were first from Muskoka Chills. Oh, we lost you on mute. You're on mute, Tina. Hi there. <laughs> so my name is Tina. We've opened up uh, Muskoka Chills. Now we're not property owners, but I thought we should, you know, kind of hear what's going on. So we look forward to, uh, you know, the, the meeting here and uh, finding out a little bit more. And we are property owners. Uh, we do own a couple of cottages in the uh, Port Carling area. All right, thank you, Tina. I'm gonna pop over to Terry, who's no stranger to the downtown core of Port Carling. Hi, uh, sorry, I missed the entire first part. Of what just, you, are you asking why we're here today? <laughs> just, not necessarily why you're here, but just to say hi, who you are and where you're zooming in from. I am zooming in from Palm Springs, California. <laughs> Soon to be on my way back to Muskoka. Um, I, yeah, I have a business in uh, Port Carling, but I do a lot of uh, work in Bala and Port Carling. Um, so I'm just uh, here to sort of see what's what's happening and the latest, greatest. All right. What about uh, over to Lisa, Venus? How are you? Hi, Nora. I'm really good. Thanks. Um, I'm here in Minette and uh we're, uh, we run a company called Muskoka Smart Homes, but we also own a building in town and we're interested in developing that property and being a strong part of the community. So that's why we're here tonight. Great. And I hope you've got my emails. You and I have to chat on a couple of other things too. Perfect. Uh, Allie, you want to introduce yourself and where you're zooming in from? And Oh, take yourself off mute. That better? I'm zooming in from just outside of Port Carling, and I guess I'm similar to Lisa. We have a property uh, personally in town, and then um, I work on behalf of our Muskoka Stakeholders Association and just kind of trying to be informed about um, kind of all things township related, just so kind of broad knowledge and make sure that encompassed in everything, I guess. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, Scott. From Vision, you've got your fireflies on to take your notes. Where are you, though? I can't see you. Want to say hello? Nope, maybe you just put his note taker in. Okay. Um, Ian Richards has just joined us. Hi, Ian. Has to unmute. Well, he's just coming in. So, all right. So, I think we can probably get rolling. Um, again, just uh, if you have questions and if you want me to ask them for you or, you know, you can put your hand up and we can you can unmute that sort of thing. Otherwise, I'd say stay on mute until you're ready. Uh, but if you want me to ask the question for you or you think something's getting missed, feel free to use the chat. I'll keep an eye on that. 
Um, and uh, thanks. So James uh, Cox is with us and he has a short presentation for us. So uh, James, you have uh, sharing capability. So why don't you take it away? You got the floor. All right. Uh, well, thank you uh, very much for the introduction, Nora, and for organizing this event. I think events like this that the Chamber puts on are really helpful uh, for getting uh, as much information out to the business community as possible as we possibly can, because we have these programs in place to support our businesses and to help contribute to having a more vibrant downtown in the urban centers that we have here in the township and uh, we want people to take advantage of them. So I'm uh, very happy to have the opportunity to, uh, to, sp to speak on this tonight. So um, as was said, um, the Township of Muskoka Lakes back in two, uh, 2021 approved their community improvement plan. And what a community improvement plan is, is it's a planning tool that allows municipalities to do a few things that are a little out of the ordinary in the pursuit of achieving specifically specific policy goals that we have for the community. So, for example, the Muskoka Lakes uh, Community Improvement Plan uh, talks about the need to have uh, vibrant downtowns, uh, accessible downtowns. Uh, public space, um, you know, inviting public spaces, walkable communities. Uh, it speaks to a lot of the different um, things that we'd like to see in our communities and gives the municipality some tools in order to actually incentivize developments that help achieve those goals. So if you look in the community improvement plan, there's really two halves to it. One is the public sector half, which deals with um, things that the municipality can do in order to um, improve our communities and advance the goals of the plan. So ever since the plan was adopted, the township has been working on a few public realm projects every year in order to, uh, to further those goals. So the wayfinding signage that has been redone in the township over the last few years, that was part of the community improvement plan. The re revitalization of the street furniture that is located in our downtowns was done as part of the community improvement plan. The installation of, um, you know, increased cycling infrastructure in Hannah Park, for example, that was a community improvement plan project. So that's one half of it. But the CIP also exists in order to create uh, incentives for private sector uh, operators like all of yourselves uh, to encourage them to revitalize and redevelop their properties. So the CIP, the tools that are exist within the CIP that are targeted at the private sector, they aim to both improve existing properties in the downtown cores of our communities, but also promote redevelopment uh, within our communities as well. Again, moving in line with those, those goals that we've laid out in the community improvement plan. So if you take a look through the community improvement plan itself, and I heartily recommend anyone who is in on this call does so, you'll see that there are a number of different uh, elements to it. There's uh, projects that are aimed at revitalizing public spaces. There's urban design guidelines to encourage um, property owners in the downtown to, if they're redeveloping their facade or improving their building, that we do so, that they do so in a way that is coherent with the rest of the downtown. There's plans in there that speaks to uh, improvements in uh, streetscaping, our, our communities, uh, things like the uh, addition of missing sidewalk links along our main streets, the addition of uh, crosswalks uh, in Bala and Port Carling, the first one in Port Carling, we're coordinating it with the district, but it will be going in this year. And then there's the business or private sector incentive programs, which is what we're going to be spending most of our time talking about tonight. So uh, Nora sent out in the invitation uh, a sense of where the bounds of the CIP are. So the community improvement plan, the, the programs that are available through it, only apply within the boundaries that are specified as part of the CIP. So we've got the two maps up here on your screen, and I do have more detailed maps that we can go into a, a little later if anyone has some questions about where the boundaries are, where the, where, where the lines are drawn, and if a property is in or out of the boundary. 
Now, the reason why these boundaries were set to focus on the downtown core specifically is that um, when the plan was being developed, our consultant who was doing it on behalf of the township identified that there ultimately uh, is a limited amount of funding that can go into community improvement projects. And so the decision was made to focus uh, the community improvement plan on very specific areas so that the available funding could be concentrated within a single geographic area. And the idea is, is that by concentrating that funding, we'll have um, the results of the projects that are undertaken will have, uh, will be more focused, then we'll see more visible, uh, invisible improvements. So the project area in Bala uh, runs along uh, Muskoka Road 169, starting from the uh, sports park on the north end of town and running south along the 169 corridor all the way to the south end of town by Windsor Drive. Now you'll note if you look at the map here, this does also include Bala Falls Road. And you'll see that in some cases, uh, there are properties that have been added on to this boundary that are outside of the, the main corridor. Um, I don't know how well you can see it, but Jasper Park in Bala is, has been added on to uh, the area as well. And where you have those additional properties added on, it's really a case of there are almost all, I believe actually they are all uh, properties that are owned by the township, which would benefit from the um, which would benefit from the uh, public realm initiatives that are identified in the program. Uh, in Port Carling, uh, similarly, the uh, community improvement area runs uh, along Muskoka Road 118, starting from Bruce, Will Bruce Wilson uh, Drive and the uh, Foodland uh, area, running all the way through the downtown uh, to the municipal offices where I am right now. And again, as you can see um, properties like the uh, James Bartleman Island with the Muskoka Lakes Museum, Hannah Park, uh, those are all public properties that have been added on to the into the boundary as well. Uh, so the main reason why we're here tonight is to talk about the um, private sector incentive programs and to answer any questions that you may have. So the purpose of these programs is to encourage and incentivize property owners or tenants uh, on privately owned properties that are located in our CIP areas to help to stimulate investment and, um, and improvement projects in those properties, especially in cases where it makes a visible and concrete contribution to the overall vitality of the downtown areas. So every year, the Council of the Township has uh, puts funding into the Community Improvement Plan Reserve to fund the program. So we have a certain pot of money that is available in grants every year. If that money is not used every year, uh, it stays in the reserve and is available to fund community improvement projects in the future. So the way the program operates is we have two intake windows per year. Uh, so there's two periods during the year, in the spring and the fall, where we solicit uh, applications from the community, where we invite property owners or tenants who are thinking about improving their property uh, to contact us and work with us to uh, put in a community improvement plan application. We are in the middle of one of those intake windows right now. The current intake window will run through until the end of this month, uh, May 31st. And we're anticipating that the second intake window for 2024 will open up in September of this year after the busy season is done. So there are five program streams that are available through the private sector incentive program. And they have different, uh, different levels and different funding, funding requirements that we'll look at uh, in a little bit uh, for each stream. But broadly speaking, the five streams that are identified are for uh, attainable or employee housing, uh, shoreline structures, so the addition of new docks or slips uh, in the downtown areas of our communities, uh, plumbing and mechanical upgrades. So if you're doing any interior work to your building, <coughs> pardon me, sorry. If you're doing any interior work to your building that involves uh, adding new technology to your building, uh, making enhancements to the building that will allow it to be used year round, uh, accessibility upgrades, energy efficiency upgrades, all of those sorts of things fall under the building and mechanical upgrade stream. 
Um, the fourth stream is accessibility and facade upgrades. So this is anything that's exterior to the building, ranging from repainting the exterior of your building to installing new signage, new lighting, uh, any sort of facade enhancement. And finally, we have a program stream for ecological space improvements. So that is uh, landscaping, uh, the planting of trees or gardens, public art, benches, that sort of thing. So every property that is located within the downtown core, uh, within those areas that I identified earlier, is eligible to submit up to two applications per property per year. So if you have a project that is, you're doing considerable work on a building, you're going to be upgrading the facade, but also doing some interior improvements, maybe some energy efficiency upgrades, you have the ability to apply for both the building mechanical upgrade stream and the accessibility and facade upgrade stream. So you can apply it, even though from your perspective, it is one large project, you can apply for different elements of the overall project from different streams, as long as you're not submitting more than two applications a year. So really there's a lot of flexibility uh, for property owners and, and tenants if they are looking at uh, doing these sorts of works, because it's the sort of thing that the community improvement plan was created to encourage. So there are three tools that are available um, under the uh, financial incentive program. And we'll look in a little more detail in a few moments about what uh, tools are available for each program. But the three categories of tools are construction grants. And this is the main, uh, the main tool that the CIP allows us to provide, which is financial assist, direct financial assistance from the township in the form of matching funds up to a maximum amount for the purpose of encouraging development projects. So if you are applying for a particular project and you've got a project budget of say $30,000 and you're applying under the uh, facade improvement stream, we will say that, for example, if you're approved, the township will fund 25% of eligible costs up to a maximum stated amount and then when you go off and do the project, you when the project is done, you will submit receipts to the municipality and we will reimburse you for up to the maximum approved grant amount. Um, under the CIP, there are also fee rebates that are available in certain cases. Uh, so that would be rebates uh, and waivers for municipal fees and charges, such as building permits, planning applications, or things like that. For the Attainable and Employee Housing Program, there is also a tax increment grant program. And what a tax increment grant allows us to do is that the municipality will uh, rebate all or a portion of the difference uh, between the property tax bill on a property prior to construction and the taxes on a same property after construction and tax reassessment. So essentially what it does is that if you have a property that you're redeveloping as housing or some sort of significant development, and it is going to cause the assessment on that property and therefore the property taxes that are owed, that are owed on that property to increase substantially, you have the ability to apply for a tax increment grant and effectively phase in that increase over a series of years. So you will receive a grant from the municipality to offset that increase in um, increase in property taxes over, uh, usually it's a five-year term, but that is, these these sorts of agreements are negotiated on a, on a case-by-case -case basis, depending on the nature of the particular uh, development that's being put into place. So in terms of eligibility, we've talked already about the community improvement plan area, so the properties have to be located within the boundary. Um, in order to be eligible for funding, you must either be the the owner of the property or building, or be the tenant with written permission from the owner. So it was noted that um, I think we have one attendee here who doesn't necessarily own the property, uh, instead leases the property that they operate their business on. Uh, you're still eligible to uh, apply for community improvement programs, pro provided that you have the permission of the owner to do so. Uh, projects have to meet all required codes and regulations. So if you are doing work that requires a building permit, for example, that needs to be uh, that needs to be in place in order for a CIP uh, grant to be approved. Um, 
applications must be submitted and approved prior to project work commencing. So there's no retroactive funding that's available through this program. Uh, any expenses that are incurred on a project prior to the application being approved are ineligible for funding. But say, for example, if you have a large project, you start on one element of it before you submit a CIP application and you submit an application for the remainder of the work that is to be done later in the year, that would be eligible. You just would not be eligible to submit the work that uh, existed or that had already been done. And I've already noted that there is uh, each, each property can apply for two applications per, per calendar year. Uh, so the application process is reasonably straightforward. In a, in a few moments, I'll, I'll walk you through that. But the first, the first step on the process, and probably the most important one, is a pre-consultation meeting with uh, township staff. So in, in virtually all cases, that will be a pre-consultation with myself. So uh, reach out to, to me. Let me know that you are planning on submitting a community improvement plan application, and we'll arrange a meeting where we will go through your project with you, identify what expenses could be eligible, what expenses are ineligible, and essentially give you all the information that you need in order to submit a complete application. Uh, so that way we can identify if there's any, uh, if your project is eligible, uh, what you can do to improve your odds of approval if it is eligible, and give you that sort of guidance. So once you've had that pre-consultation meeting, submit the application. It's a very simple online form. Uh, to go along with that application, though, there is some supporting documentation that we require. Uh, now, this will vary from project to project, depending on what you're proposing to do. But generally speaking, if they are available, we ask for any drawings or plans for the work that you're planning on doing. So if you have a concept of how your project is going to change the exterior of your building, you've got that information, please provide it to us. We ask for photos of the area where the work is going to be done to establish sort of what the property or what the, the area looked like before. So we can compare that to the uh, to the results when the project is finished. And we also require two cost estimates for any work that is being done on the, uh, on the property. Once we have that information, once all the applications have been submitted in an intake window, uh, staff reviews the applications, ensures they're complete, and then brings forward recommendations to uh, committee and council for approval. So committee will review the applications, uh, note that if there's any, any concerns that they have, once the, that review is done, goes to council for approval, and then we execute an agreement with the uh, with the proper with the applicant for the community improvement grant. Uh, so we'll go to questions in a moment, but before we do that, I wanted to show you uh, where you can find all this information on the community improvement plan on the township website. So um, everyone should be able to see the township website here. So if you go to the Muskoka Lakes uh, website, uh, oops, it's not right. No. Um, on our top bar here, under business and property development, you will see that there is a page for the community improvement plan. And if you go to this page, uh, all the information that you need in order to determine whether your project is eligible or not uh, and get that sort of information that is all located on this website. So there's a few things that I want to draw your attention to. The full community improvement plan is linked here uh, on this uh, map of downtown Port Carling. That's on the left hand or that's on the right hand side of the page. Uh, so you can take, if you want to take a look through the community improvement plan itself and get a better understanding of what it's trying to do, this is where you can access that information. And the reason I highlight this is because when the township is assessing its the applications that we receive, uh, priority is given to, to projects that specifically address the policy goals that are included within the community improvement plan. So as I mentioned already, we want to promote the year-round economy. We want to beautify the downtown. We want to improve business viability in the downtown, specifically as it relates to the year-round economy. And there are a few other goals that are noted in the plan as well. Uh, 
So when you're putting together your application, if you're looking for ways in which you can uh, make your project stand out or improve, improve the odds of it getting accepted, if you can address how your project specifically meets the goals of the community improvement plan, that will go a long way towards uh, ensuring that your project is uh, project is successful. So on this page as well, you will uh, you'll see here it says find out more information about each of our programs in the policy. So if you click on this, it will bring you to our community improvement plan private sector incentive program policy. It's a bit of a mouthful, but this policy lays out in detail uh, all of the information about each of the streams that's available, the application process, and also notes the criteria by which uh, applications are, ex are um, assessed. So uh, as it says here, priority will be given to applications that meet the objectives of the CIP, promote year-round business operation, benefit public-facing businesses, fit with the industry focus of the respective grant stream, make tangible, visible contributions to the vitality of downtown cores, are expected to have a significant economic impact, and are economically viable. So if you can show how your project meets those goals, that will, again, help you your project stand out when it's being assessed. So going back to this website that we have on the township homepage, um, if you scroll down, there's a section here on private sector incentive programs. And we've got each of our program streams here. And this is where you can find summarized what funding or support is available for each program stream. So if we were to look at, for example, building accessibility and facade upgrades, we bring down our little accordion menu here. It notes the rough purpose of the program and the tools available. So you can apply for a fee rebate under the program, or you can apply for a construction grant under the program. And under this particular stream, uh, you can apply for a grant of up to 50% of eligible costs to a maximum of $25,000 per property. So if you are doing facade and accessibility upgrades that have a budget of $50,000 or more, you could apply for that maximum $25,000 grant. Uh, if it is less than $50,000, you'd be eligible for up to 50% of those costs. And I do note that the maximum grant award is based on the receipts that we receive and not necessarily the um, the quotes that we receive. So if you uh, undertake a project and it comes in under budget, I know that doesn't happen very often for many things these days, but if it winds up costing less than was anticipated, the grant amount would be adjusted to uh, uh, to match. Again, that doesn't come up very often, but I'd like to flag it for everyone just so if anyone finds themselves in that situation in the future, they're not surprised. Um, we also note that many of the streams have a minimum uh, budget that is uh, that is acceptable. Uh, so we note here that the minimum amount awarded under this incentive program is $5,000. So a project would need to have at least a minimum of $10,000 in order to be considered eligible for that, under that cost. So every uh, grant program has different thresholds. So for example, the uh, building and structural and mechanical upgrade uh, program is similar. You can apply for up to 50% of eligible cost to a maximum of $25,000 per property. But if we were to look at say the attainable housing, uh, attainable or employee housing program, that allows for a grant of up to 25% of eligible costs to a maximum of $40,000 per property. So the overall matching funds are at a lower rate, but the overall uh, cap on the grant program is higher. And that's out of recognition that uh, projects that are developing attainable or employee housing will have larger program budgets than, than facade improvements or, or anything like that. So the grant programs have additional criteria that are included uh, in there that I think would be worth reviewing. Uh, for anyone who is interested in doing so. Uh, but that is effectively the end of the prepared materials I had for today. And I'd be happy to answer any questions that, uh, that anyone may have. And I'll turn it back to Nora to, to facilitate that portion of our session today. Okay, if you want to just stop the screen share, um, I think that might help a little bit. We can come back to it. I do have a couple of questions. Um, some are just sort of housekeeping. So um, because you had the screen share on, I didn't quite understand this question, but 
when you actually open up the CIP plan, James, um, yes. when you click on it, the right, it, it actually, every single page after the first page still says draft. Is that just a, is that just an oversight? It says draft in the bottom right-hand corner of every page. Um, oh, dear. oh, you know what? The final, re this is the final report from 2021. That's the old yep. one. You know what? It's showing the old one, I think. So on the- well. I, I should note that uh, that that is that is a typo. This is the final community improvement plan. Uh, there have not been any changes to the plan itself. Um, the policy was updated earlier this year um, that implements the plan, but the plan itself has not been updated. However, uh, we are doing a review of it right now, and I anticipate that will change by the end of this year. Okay, and now while we're on changes, I do have some questions here. Um, do the zones ever get reassessed? Is there a plan to expand the zone? There's a couple of follow-ups on that, but let's just start there. Yes, so um, we are actually in the midst of a review of the uh, boundaries right now. Um, so this issue will be coming back to council within the uh, coming months to get their direction on uh, how they would like to uh, how they'd like to approach this. So uh, the short answer is at the moment there are no concrete plans to expand the zones, but it is under review right now. And once that review is complete, there may be changes that are recommended as a result of that. And once though once that uh, once we have some direction out of out about that, we certainly the, will be in communication with the chamber, and you can help flow that information out to out to your members. I think this is a follow-up, which I think you've sort of answered, but it, I think it's worth asking. So if an application gets put in and it's outside of this specific zone, is it ever looked at as a possibility? I think you just said possibly <laughs> later. Well, um, so we're not, we're, we're not able to fund projects that are outside of the zone as designated. Um, that is uh, that is a legislative requirement uh, based on the Planning Act and the provincial legislation we have to operate under. However, if the um, if the program if we do receive an application that's not eligible because of the boundaries and at some future uh, point the boundaries do change, we would retain that uh, information on our records and we would reach back out to the applicant to advise them that things have changed and if they wish to resubmit their application, they're welcome to do so. Okay. Um, did you want to talk the housing? If you've got a, you, so you did a pre consult and there was, sorry, Blake has just joined us. Blake Johnson is also our secretary treasurer of our board. And you said that you had something that it looked like it was good. And then James, James will remember. Yeah. Oh, okay. We, uh, put in an application yes. for yes. housing. We're denied, uh, be, even though it uh, was inside the uh, business improvement area, we were denied because it was a uh, zoned residential, which really seemed odd. Uh, are we going to be able to review that and and change that? Because in the in the future, that does doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. Staff housing in a residential would make some sense, would it not? Yes, and so the um, uh, as part of the broader review, we are looking specifically at enhancing the attainable and employee housing um, require or availability of that grant. Um, it's recognized that certainly um, I think the idea when the community improvement plan was put into place is that we would be looking at developing infill housing within our communities. But it was also tied to some of the requirements that the District of Muskoka has around their attainable housing program. Um, we recognize that uh, certainly with the larger housing crisis that is affecting the entire country right now, um, any support that is available needs to be uh, available as widely as possible. So we are looking at um, different avenues by which we can expand the availability of that uh, of that program. That's part of the broader review of the CIP that's going on right now. Uh, I'm anticipating that there will be some expansion of the availability of, of that grant uh, in future intakes. Um, however, again, I it's it's too early to speak of any details at this moment. And uh, I've got a question myself that for those of us that are just sort of learning about it now, that, that doesn't include me, I've, I've been involved in the CIP process, but um, you know, I really took a good hard look at uh, what I need to do in the way of uh, accessible washrooms, for example, and that it got put off by our landlord and put off. And now as a 24, I think I actually have to move ahead, but there's probably no way that I would be able to get two quotes 
and the drawings and everything yeah. done now before May 31st. So is there, so if we were to start working on that now, when would you expect a potential second intake if we miss the May 31st deadline? So we're anticipating that the second intake will take place in the fall of this year. Uh, we'll probably uh, put out the call for applications uh, mid-August and people will, uh, potential applicants will have until likely mid-October to, to submit those. All right. And I mean, you spoke about the criteria, but is there scoring on that criteria? Like uh, how do you, could you just really quickly again about what criteria what criteria are the main ones in using to assess these applications? Yeah, so um, let me call up our policy uh, again. So there's a few um, ways in which we prioritize applications. Um, different accessibility or different program streams are identified are prioritized in the plan itself. So the highest priority streams are the attainable or employee housing program the shoreline structure program, accessibility upgrades under the building accessibility and facade upgrade program, and the ecological spaces program, so the landscaping and public space element of it. Medium priority is the building structural and mechanical upgrade, and then the lower priority is the facade upgrade program, and that's identified in the community improvement plan itself. So that is not to say that any applications for facade improvement will automatically be considered low priority. It is that if we ever find ourselves in a position of having to choose between two applications we receive, if there's not enough funding to meet all applications, which has not been the case as of yet, but could conceivably happen at some point in the future, we will prioritize the applications based on, based on that information. Um, with regard to the other um, criteria that have been identified, things like meeting the objectives of the CIP, promoting year-round business operation, things like that. There aren't a specific, there's not a specific score that's assigned to each of those. It is more that if we have to choose again between two applications, one that does clearly meet the objectives of the CIP and one that doesn't, the one that clearly meets the objectives of the CIP will be given priority. Okay. As I said, we haven't been in the case where we've had to prioritize these projects um, as of as of yet, uh, but it could conceivably happen sometime in the future. Terry, uh, thanks. Just a little bit of a follow up on the uh, prioritization. I just I'm not sure how many people are aware, but as of the beginning of this year, the district has a requirement on commercial buildings, and the only way they're policing it is through the permit application. So if you're going to do any work on a commercial building. You have to have a backflow preventer survey done, and that is uh, goes on your water system, incoming water. And what it does is it stops uh, contamination of the water system. So this is going to be a, a requirement of all commercial uh, buildings. So if you're going to apply for a permit, but I just thought that it's, I mean, obviously important. That's why the district is on it. Um, that it might be even though it falls under the sort of mechanical, it might be a bit of a priority and maybe a really great spot to help out businesses who this is gonna, so far it's been a surprise on a couple of, a couple of fronts uh, and time consuming. So if you can get ahead of it, um, might be a good idea. I just wanted to throw that out there. Thank you for that. That's a really good comment. Now, I had some questions ahead of the meeting, uh, James. Uh, as you know, you know, some people are moving from either Port Carling to Bala, Bala to Port Carling. We just saw pure Muskoka signs go up and uh, on the what was the Muskoka wake. And so some are some are actually coming to me and saying, so we're in the middle of doing our signage, but should we wait and try to get involved in this program? But if they've already started, are, are they already ineligible? Yeah, yes. Unfortunately, that is uh, that is. Um, a restriction that we have to operate under. We can't provide retroactive funding under the provincial legislation that we we operate under. So we, um, again, uh, uh, through sessions like this, we encourage everyone, if they're thinking about doing some work or they're considering making any sort of investment in their property, to reach out to us as early as possible. 
Um, I'm think our our theory is or our, our plan is that we're going to move our application window a little earlier next year so that we can uh, we can capture some of these businesses that are getting ready for the summer season. Uh, we were delayed this year because of the review and update of the policy, unfortunately. But uh, going forward, we're going to uh, uh, get this intake earlier in the spring. Okay, and and is there an amount that's too small? <laughs> we have all of our signs got ripped down in front of our building and uh, I can see some, you know, if people want to put some signage up. Is there something that's too minimal that you wouldn't like, for example, if we were putting a new sign up um, would it, if it, and it was only a couple of thousand dollars, is that too little to apply for? So um, most of the program uh, programs that are available will note that there is a minimum project budget that will be considered. So anything below that amount would be outside of the scope. However, I will note that for particular projects that meet the goals of a CIP, we do have some ability to make an exception for that. So uh, I, again, there's there's the guidelines that encourage projects of a certain size. But if there is a particular project that is... Um, vital to the continued operation of the business or clearly meets those goals of the community improvement plan uh, reach out and let's have a conversation about that great and can you give us any idea of what the take-up is uh, you know have been people storming ahead on this or are you still waiting for things to come in well we have uh received there's been since this intake has opened, there has certainly been a lot of interest. We've had a number of pre-consultation meetings. Um, we have not yet received any many full applications yet. So I'd encourage anyone who is thinking about doing it or has done a pre-consultation already uh, to uh, please, uh, please, please reach out and go ahead and submit that application. And what would stop that, James? If, for example, let's say I get, I know that Terry at one point had offered to do our, our specs for our accessible washroom, for example, there's an, and we didn't have to move ahead on it, but now it, now it's suddenly 2024 and now we've got to look at it again. Um, if we had just one quote, like, would you, would it, I mean, I guess we'd still have to wait till the next intake period because, and then, well, and we can also apply for something like that if we had, because we have to pay for the architectural drawings or whatever, um, we can get a portion of that back as well, correct? That's right. Yes. So, you know, we judge uh, we judge each application individually on sort of what is what it, what is necessary in terms of uh, plans, drawings, things like that. So I will say that um, if you are working on the design or you don't necessarily have that in place, um, that doesn't preclude you from submitting uh, an application. You can note that that is in place. We may make approval of a grant conditional upon receiving those um, those plans in the future and ensuring that they they meet any requirements that they need to do. But you can still apply even if you don't necessarily have that in hand. And we have the ability if the pro pro project is approved, we can make the approval conditional um, as a result of that. Great. Now, with regard to um, the first part of your question regarding quotes, we do recognize that it is becoming increasingly challenging to get um, construction quotes uh, with how tight the market is up market is up around here, and it we have had multiple applications where they have only been able to find one firm to do the work. Uh, in that case, again, you're not precluded from submitting an application. You can submit the one quote that you have. But we do require both an explanation as to why only one quote is being submitted and also um, some proof for some assessment that you can provide us that this quote represents fair market value for the services that you are achieving. I'm just going to mention that uh, Christopher Spraggett of uh, Summerhouse just uh, joined us in the meeting. So, Christopher, you may have some questions, and we are also recording this so we can send it back out to everyone if you really, if you would like to rewatch. Um, this raises another question, too. I really appreciate the supporting documentation and understanding that there is some flexibility there. I think that people will feel really uh, you know, reassured by that. It's not going to stop them from trying to get the quotes, but knowing that they can at least get into the process, I, I think that's really great to hear. Um, the multiple streams. You had said that you could apply for two streams, and I just wondered if there's, is there a way that they should be doing that? How do they submit the grant application if they're doing it for multiple streams? Is it yeah. all in one, or do you want them all separate? 
Uh, yep. So uh, that's a great question. Uh, and again, uh, with regards to questions like that, that's another reason why we really encourage people to reach out to us because we can walk through the um, application with you and determine sort of what the best way to to approach it for your project is. Um, so with regard to the uh, applications, I'm just going to share my screen again here for a moment. The application form is on the website. And it's right down here at the bottom. So if we open up this application uh, form, just taking a moment to load. Um, so this is what the form looks like. You just need your information about the name of the business or owner, uh, contact information, address, roll number, some questions about property taxes, any fire code violations, these sorts of things. And here where it notes, please check which program you're applying for, you have the ability to, of course, select multiple programs. And then when you note your um, what funding tool you are requesting, uh, say you're requesting a grant under two streams, we note grant. And then in the line here where we request how much funding you are requesting, you would note down which uh, how much you're requesting under each stream, supported by the supporting documentation that you submit. So there's one application form where you can identify identify multiple streams. So just uh, just a clarification on that, James. So yep. even though there was the full amount requested, yet you've chosen two streams, it, does that drop down so you can do stream one, stream two? Yes, it does. Yeah, and we will also. Um, when we're reviewing the applications, if it's ever unclear, we will reach out to the owner for 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 clarification about that. Okay. Um, someone just commented too that uh, they just wanted to follow up that it was a good comment from Terry regarding the plumbing separation. They've got a quote for twelve hundred dollars plus the original assessment of several hundred. Call it two thousand with tax, and that's a that's a hit for a small business. A CIP grant would really help. So. It's nice to have that feedback directly um, from someone. It, are there any other questions? Again, if you're if you're if your video isn't on, I can't see you on the screen. So please just uh, unmute yourself and speak up, or throw something into the chat if you like to. Seeing none. Okay. Um, so James, exact. What has to be ready by May 31st? You've got to have ticked off those boxes, get as yeah. much, as you, much as you can and have your consultation with you, right? Yes, yes. Uh, have a, a range of meeting with staff uh, and get the application in. If there is some of the supporting uh, documentation that's not in place as of yet, um, that is okay, um, provided that we have enough to begin the assessment of the application itself. Uh, so certainly the uh, any quotes that you have, those are probably the most important part of the application. But if you're still waiting on drawings or assessments or things like that, that can come in afterwards. Just be aware that if your um, if your application is approved, the application will be conditional upon receiving those sorts of supporting documents to the to a satisfaction of the township. All right. I just want to say that I just threw into the ch uh, chat some shameless chamber promo, but it's uh, all good news. Um, a good uh, fun afternoon hours at the Water's Edge Wine Bar and Grill. If it's raining on June 6th, we hit June 13th. And please save the date for the 60th anniversary of the Muskoka Lakes Museum. And you can sign up. And if you because you were here at this meeting today, um, why don't you uh, you can give me a call and I'll give you a promo code so you can pass on the the admission fee. Now, um, yes, uh, Terry, you've got a question on the public CIP. Go for it. Thanks. Uh, just out of curiosity, I wondered what was in the works for this year, as far as the public sector, what you're planning on on uh, doing. I heard you speak about the crosswalk. Is that the one at the at the bridge? Along? Yes. Yes. So um, oh, there yes. we go. <laughs> There'll be three, yes, there will be. Uh, there's three pro projects that are under works uh, this year. Uh, the first, as you mentioned, is the crosswalk, which we are uh, putting in in coordination with the district of Muskoka. It's certainly been a long time coming. Yeah. Um, the second is we are attempting to work with uh, CP Rail to beautify some of the rail bridges in Bala. 
uh, to um, do something with them, paint them, beautify them as much as possible. Now, we are dependent on getting approval from CP for that, so I'm very hopeful that project will be going forward. We're trying to work through that process right now. And uh, the third one is we're working on um, developing some new entrance signage for Bala itself. So we're still um, still in the very early phases of that one, trying to figure out locations, what it's going to look like. I imagine there'll be some public consultation on that one that will be coming later in the summer, uh, but we're just starting that process right now. Has there any, been any discussion about uh, sidewalks in Bala at all? Uh, so certainly, if you look through the plan, the the um, uh, it it identifies a number of transportation enhancements, missing portions of sidewalk in both Port Carly and Bala and, and crosswalks. So we are working with the District of Muskoka on that. Um, of course, uh, as anyone who's had to deal with this situation knows, it, it can sometimes be challenging working with two levels of government with overlapping responsibilities, but uh, we are continuing to, to, to press press for that. So I don't have anything uh, tangible to uh, announce at this point, but it is something that we're continuing to raise. Thank you. James, earlier, uh, someone had asked me if they're, that they thought that last year, the township had actually put funding aside for murals on the train bridge. I was quite surprised by that because I didn't think it had gotten that far at all. So that the person who asked that question sounds like you're way more in the loop than I am. <laughs> is that funding still existing or is that gone? That was last yeah. year, wasn't it? it the, that was a project that was carried forward uh, from last year um, because uh, again, we have ran into some challenges working with uh, CP to get their permission to uh, work on the bridges. Um, we're still working through that process, but I am more optimistic than I was a few months ago that we may see some action. Oh, great news. Um, so just we've got 10, 10 on the call. And as I said, I can only see you if you've got your screen on. So if you've got any, here's sort of a chance. Allie, did you have any last questions or thoughts? I'm going to just run around the room. Nope, I'm good. Thanks, Nora. Appreciate it. Uh, Christopher Spraggett, you've just joined us from Summer House. Um, did you have any specific questions you wanted asked in this session? Because please free, feel, free, feel free to go ahead. Uh, the only specific question I have is, I was just curious about the sidewalks in Port Carling, uh, the ones on Joseph Street. I, just wondering if uh, we know when that's anticipated on happening or if that's happening. Um. So I don't have a specific uh, date to provide at this point, but I certainly can um, reach out to my colleagues at the district and ask them about where this uh, falls within their capital plan. Um, the way that these enhancements work is that we are relying on the district to actually do the work because it's their road, road allowance. However, we've set aside funding through the CIP that when they have identified these projects that we can help fund them and essentially move them uh, a little higher along the priority um, the priority scope. Um, okay. So I don't have a specific answer, but I can look into that and uh, let you know when we have an answer. Okay, that'd be great. Thank you. Okay, and uh, Scott Parsons has his Fireflies note taker on. I don't think he's actually in the room. I think he's just taking notes. Scott, are you with us? That? No, I really don't think so. I think he's just uh, taking notes. So I can ask him to unmute though, just in case. Scott, nope. Um, Ian Richards from Duff's. Any thoughts? Probably listening in. And uh, okay, gonna move on to John Crowley. John, did you have any other last thoughts? No, I'm good, Nora. Thanks very much. Wonderful. Okay, great. And uh, Lisa from Muskoka Smart Homes? Yeah, I think uh, it was a really good information session. And uh, I have a couple of initiatives underway. And I think my next steps is to set up a, an appointment and, um, you know, figure out because you know, if you think about like we were looking at updating our HVAC and, uh, you know, it's not just a, a one and done thing. So I just have to understand if there is a construction project 
how can I phase it to fit in mm -hmm. with the the grant period? So. All right, thank you. And uh, Tina from uh, Muskoka Chills, did you have anything? Nothing on my end, thank you. Yeah, I guess that almost gets the last word to Terry Ledger again. And if you want it one more time, Terry. I think I don't think anybody wants to hear anymore from me, <laughs> but I do want to thank you for uh, letting me join in. And uh, yeah, it's uh, good information. And it's always good to hear from the township and not guess these things. So I guess the takeaway is get in touch with you first and go from there. Yep. Give me a call. I'm happy, happy to chat at any time. Right. And well, I'm I outside the area, so it won't be me. <laughs> I'd like to make a comment too that, you know, last year I know that there were some comments about some of the grants that were awarded and people don't realize sometimes that, um, you know, it might not be a consumer facing or a facade or an outside. I'll, I'll take an example of some windows that were done, but that was an energy efficiency move that you know, is good for our climate as well. We want our businesses to be energy efficient. So, so when you see these things being approved, you know, take a step back and think about what does it mean and, and how did it apply to the criteria? Because I think that we can all do that and counselors included that, you know, it may be that, oh, they did the windows, but they, they did the work, they got the quotes and they're, you know, they're stopping emissions. So that's a good thing. And so there's a lot of different ways that this can be approached within the criteria. So the takeaways, um, you got support available for a wide variety of projects, uh, um, especially those that really contribute to downtown revitalization. I have to put in a plug here for Bala that's been waiting for its crosswalk for over 20 years now. And uh, I know it's been moved a few times and I'm hoping they'll move it back to perhaps the correct spot because it's a, uh, and then, uh, uh, and I think when Terry and I were involved in this and, and uh, Angie O'Hara, we had imagined in the beginning that it would just be, you know, yellow lines, a crosswalk, a, a calming area uh, near the locks. Um, I'll be watching with interest as they put up lights and things right at the locks. It kind of makes me nervous, but I'm sure they know what they're doing. Um, when I, that would be I imagine, a district project. Um, full details, again, on the municipal website. If you're having a hard time finding it, you can also, you can get it through James. You can get it through myself. And first of all, reach out to James. He's the guy. He knows the questions. Um, and, and he's got all kinds of them coming at him. Please don't be shy. Please ask these questions and share the information that this is available. I mean, it is very, very new when you think it's only a couple of years. It was only a few years ago where anything that would be a township was providing money was considered municipal bonus. Bonusing. But the province made these kinds of mechanisms available. And uh, so it's relatively new for our township to get involved and they need to be applauded for that. So uh, meantime, you know, we hope to see you out at a chamber event. Um, if you are not a chamber member, but would like to come, please just get in touch with me and you can come as my guest and we'd be love to see you. So James, last words. Oh, well, thank you again for the opportunity to, uh, to talk about this tonight. I encourage everyone as I've said multiple times, if you have any questions, uh, get in touch with me. Um, I'm, uh, I'm around and I'm always, always happy to be of assistance. And if I'm not able to assist you with something, I can usually find out who can. So happy to, happy to chat at any time. All right. And there was one last just thought to also think about cultural heritage features and repairs to all of that. We've got so much to do. So a lot to get done. Thank you, everyone, everyone for coming. I am recording this. Uh, you won't want to hear me talking this much, but uh, I will be happy to send it out to anyone who wants it. Have a great evening.